Hi guys, this is O Level Chemistry Paper One Specimen Twenty Twenty Three. Question One: Stearic acid has a melting point of sixty nine degrees Celsius. A heated sample of pure stearic acid is cooled, and the temperature is recorded every minute for thirty minutes. A graph of the result is shown. Which process occurs between eight and twelve minutes? So basically, we have liquid stearic acid present at time equals zero minutes and then that liquid is being cooled and they have mentioned that the melting point of stearic acid is 69 degrees celsius so as you can see this part of the graph this is just below 70 so this is 69 this is where stearic acid melts so it melts if you are increasing the temperature but when you are decreasing the temperature, this is the point where steric acid should freeze. So this is the freezing point of steric acid when the temperature is being cooled. So if you look at the graph, initially going from 80 till 69, you have your liquid cooling. And then going from 69 till 50. This is the part where uh, your liquid has converted into a solid already because it has undergone freezing. So this is the solid being cooled. So this is what our graph is representing. And they've asked us what happens between 8 to 12 minutes. So 8 to 12 minutes, we have the steric acid already being converted into a solid. So 8 till 12, this is the part that they want us to identify. And we have already identified this part as steric acid being frozen. So the liquid being cooled and then the cool liquid being converted into a solid. So it's not boiling. It is not condensing. It is freezing yes it is not melting so the correct answer for question one is option c question two which statements are correct the volume of a gas at constant pressure increases as the temperature increases so the relationship between volume and temperature is directly proportional as given by Charles Law. So statement one says volume of a gas at constant pressure increases as the temperature increases, which satisfies Charles Law making option one correct. Option two, when the pressure of a gas is increased, the particles move closer together. So now we have to consider the link between pressure of a gas and the volume of the container. Why volume? Because if you're talking about the particles moving closer together, that means their volume decreasing. And we know that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. What this means is that when the pressure will increase, the volume will decrease. And when the volume decreases, the particles of gas will move closer together. So based on this, we can conclude that option two is also correct. Option three, the pressure of a gas at constant volume decreases as temperature increases. Now we need to consider the relationship between pressure and temperature. And the relationship between pressure and temperature is directly proportional, which means if the pressure is increasing, the temperature must also increase. And if the pressure is decreasing, then the temperature must also decrease. And all of this at constant volume. But option three says the pressure of a gas at constant volume decreases as the temperature increases. So if the pressure is decreasing, we have to have the temperature also decreasing here. But that is not what the 
statement is saying the statement uses the term increases which is wrong if they would have used the term decreases then option three would also have been correct so if option three is wrong then we are left with only one and two as the correct option making the option b for this mcq the correct answer for this question question three which substance would diffuse most quickly now they have given us names of two different gases on all the four options and two different temperatures so what we need to consider here is what is the effect of temperature on diffusion and which gas would diffuse more quickly than the other one so the two gases under consideration are carbon dioxide and neon the first thing we need to do is find their masses so carbon dioxide consists of carbon and oxygen so we will consider its mr carbon has an mr of uh, 12 or other ar of 12 and oxygen has an ar of 16 so the mr of carbon dioxide would become 12 plus 16 plus 16 which gives us 44 whereas the other gas that we have is neon and neon has an AR of 10 as taken from the periodic table. So, in order to consider diffusion, neon has a lower AR. So, neon would be the one diffusing more quickly. So, options A and B have been eliminated based on the mass of the gas. Now, let's consider the temperature. In order for a gas to diffuse, it should move quickly. If the temperature is low, that is 0 degree Celsius, compared to the other option given, which is 25 degree Celsius, which is your room temperature, the gas would diffuse more at 25 degree Celsius as compared to 0 degree Celsius because that is a higher temperature. So, higher temperature favors diffusion. That means option C, which considers 0 degree Celsius as the temperature, is wrong. Thus, we are left with option D as the correct option for this question. Question 4. Which diagram shows the arrangement of particles inside a balloon containing a mixture of gases, nitrogen and oxygen? And they have given us this key. A black dot represents a nitrogen atom and a white circle represents an oxygen atom. So the first thing we need to recall is that nitrogen is a diatomic gas. That means two atoms of nitrogen will be covalently bonded together. The same thing is with oxygen. Oxygen is also a diatomic gas. Two atoms of oxygen will be covalently bonded together. So in order to represent nitrogen, we will have two black dots together representing nitrogen gas. And for oxygen, we will have two white circles together representing oxygen. Now, in option A, we have a white circle and a black dot individually placed. That means these are not molecules of nitrogen and oxygen. These are just atoms. So option A cannot be the correct option. In option B, we have two black circles, your black dots representing nitrogen and two white circles representing oxygen. This is correct. But the problem is all of the nitrogen molecules are kept together at the top of the balloon and all of the oxygen have been placed together at the bottom. So this separation inside a balloon is not possible the gases will be mixed together so option b is also wrong coming to option c now we have again atoms of nitrogen placed together in a molecule as two black dots and atoms of oxygen as two white circles kept together and they are mixed some nitrogen and some oxygen are placed next to each other this is how it is supposed to be so option C is the correct option. Looking at option D, 
here we have a molecule in which one atom is of nitrogen and the other is of oxygen. So basically this is nitrogen monoxide inside balloon D. So a nitrogen and oxygen are not reacting together in the given question. They just ask us arrangement of particles inside the balloon. So option D shows oxygen and nitrogen reacting together, which is not a consideration in this question. So option D is incorrect. Thus, we end up with option C as the correct option for this question. Question five, the ion Q2 positive has three complete shells of electrons. So if it has three complete shells of electrons, that means it belongs to period four. Why? Because if the shells that are complete are three, so all the first three period electrons are completely filled and the electrons that are being lost are from the fourth period. So this element belongs to period four. And because it has lost two electrons, this belongs to group two. Because group two on losing two electrons forms an ion with a two positive charge. So which element this should be? So now the given option should be compared to the placement of these elements in the periodic table. So we will consider their period and we will consider their group. So calcium belongs to group two and it is in the fourth period. So this should be the correct answer because that is what we concluded for Q2 positive. Magnesium belongs to group two, but it is in period three. So magnesium is not the correct answer. Oxygen belongs to group C six and it is in period two whereas sulfur belongs to group six and it is in period three so calcium is our correct answer for this question question six the symbol of two ions are shown F negative ion and N a positive ion. And they've asked which statement is correct. And all of these statements are considering the number of electrons, protons, and neutrons. So what we will first do is we will find out the number of electrons, protons, and neutrons in both these ions. So in order to do that, we need to recall that if we have an element, the number written at the top is called its nucleon number. And the number written at the bottom is known as its proton number. And for an atom, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. Now, if a charge is present, that will change the number of electrons present, but the proton number remains the same. Whereas the nucleon number actually represents number of protons plus number of neutrons. So in order to find the number of neutrons, we need to subtract protons from the nucleon number, number of protons from the nucleon number. So nucleon number minus number of protons will give us the number of neutrons present. So recalling this, now we find out what must be present in the two given ions. So we have fluoride ion, the number of protons present is nine as given in the question. The nucleon number is 19. So number of neutrons is equal to 19 minus nine, which is 
10. Now we come to number of electrons. So the number of electrons in the fluoride atom would be 9. But the fluoride atom has a charge of minus 1. A negative charge means gain of electron. So there is a gain of a single electron. So in this case, the number of electrons present is equal to 9 plus 1, which is equal to 10. So we have 10 electrons present in the fluoride ion. So these are the number of particles present in both the, not both, uh, only the fluoride ion. Now let's do the same process for the sodium ion, sodium Na positive. So in this case, the number of protons present is 11. The number of neutrons would be 21 minus 11, which would be 10. And the number of electrons present would be 11. And there is a charge of positive 1. A positive charge means loss of electrons. So basically, sodium positive ion has lost an electron. So we would subtract 1 from 11 and we would end up with 10 electrons for the Na positive ion. Now let's look at which statements are correct. The fluoride ion contains more electrons than the sodium ion. Fluoride has 10 electrons and sodium has 10 electrons. So this statement is not correct because both have the same number of electrons present. Option B, the sodium ion contains more neutrons than the fluoride ions. So sodium has 10 neutrons and fluoride ion also has 10 neutrons. So the number of neutrons in both the ions is the same. So this option is also incorrect. Option C, the two ions contain the same number of electrons as each other. So uh, fluoride ion contains 10 electrons and the sodium ion also contains 10 electrons, which is the same as stated in option C. So option C is correct. Now the option D mentions the two ions contain the same number of protons as each other. So we have already calculated the number of protons in the fluoride ion is 9. And the number of protons in the sodium ion is 11, which is different. And the statement says it is the same, making this statement also incorrect. So in conclusion, the correct option for question 6 is option C. Question 7. Two isotopes of chlorine are Cl35 and Cl37. What are isotopes? Isotopes are atoms of the same element having the same number of electrons and protons, but different number of neutrons. So chlorine has two isotopes, Cl35 and Cl37. So the difference in the two mass units are because of two additional neutrons in Cl37. Okay, the question is asking us, Using these isotopes, how many different relative molecular masses are possible for a compound with the molecular formula C2H3? So we have got three chlorine isotopes present in the molecule. All of them will have C2H3 common. So let's only consider the three chlorine isotopes. So in one situation, we will have all three of the chlorine isotopes having a mass of 35. So this is our first molecule. In another example, we will have two of these having a mass of 35 and one of them having a mass of 37. This is our second molecule. In our third molecule, we will have three chlorine isotopes, one having a mass of 35, while the other two having a mass of 37. As you can see, what we are doing here is we started off with all three chlorine having the mass of 35. Then we changed one of them to the isotope having a mass of 37. In the third example, we changed it to a molecule having two Cl37 isotopes. and 
this leads us to our last example in which we will have all three chlorine atoms present having a mass of 37. So altogether, the options that we got are four possibilities, four different molecules with different molecular masses. So based on this, the correct option for question seven is option C. Question eight, what happens to an atom of a group two element when it forms a compound with oxygen? Now an atom of a group two element is a metal, so it will lose two electrons to form a cation having a charge of two positive. Oxygen belonging to group six will form an anion having a two negative charge. So basically, the two electrons lost by the group two element will be gained by the oxygen atom. So we will end up with the compound of a group two metal with oxygen, a metal oxide. So this is what is happening when a group two element forms a compound with oxygen. Now let's look at the options. Option A states that it bonds with two atoms of oxygen. This is incorrect. It is bonding with one atom of oxygen. Option B, it receives two electrons from an atom of oxygen. How can group two receive electrons, whereas it is a metal, it has to lose the electrons. So option B is also incorrect. Option C, it shares two electrons with an atom of oxygen, a metal and a non-metal forms an ionic compound here. It is not forming a covalent compound. Sharing of electron takes place in covalent compound. So option C becomes incorrect. Option D, it transfers two electrons to an atom of oxygen. That is exactly the explanation we considered before looking at the option. So option D is the correct option for this question. Question nine, ethane and ammonia are covalent compounds. The dot and cross diagram of these compounds are shown. Which statements are correct? Statement one, a molecule of ethane contains twice as many hydrogen atoms as a molecule of ammonia. So as you can see, ethane contains one, two, three, four, five, and six hydrogen atoms, whereas ammonia contains one, two, Three, three hydrogen atoms. So this makes statement one correct. Statement two, an unreacted nitrogen atom has five outer electrons. So nitrogen belongs to group five of the periodic table. And any element in group five would have five electrons present in its outermost shell. So statement two says an unreacted nitrogen atom has five outer electrons. This statement is Correct. Statement three. In a molecule of ethane, the bond between the carbon atom is formed by sharing two electrons, one from each carbon atom. The question has already stated that ethane and ammonia are covalent compounds and covalent compounds are formed by sharing of electrons. So the two electrons between the two carbon atoms represented here show that these electrons are being shared between these two carbon atoms. So carbon and carbon are forming a covalent bond. So statement three is also correct. If all three statements are correct, option A becomes the correct option for this question. Question 10. A compound contains 70% by mass of iron, 
and 30% by mass of oxygen. What is the empirical formula? And the AR of oxygen and iron have been given. So we need to calculate the empirical formula here. How do we do that? First, we have iron and oxygen present. And the percentages given are 70% of iron and 30% of oxygen. So in step one, we divide these percentages by their AR value. So 70 divided by 56 and 30 divided by 16. This gives us a value of 1.25 for iron and a value of 1.875 for oxygen. In our next step, what we will do is, now we will find out the simplest ratio. How do we find out the simplest ratio? The values that we have obtained, we divide them by the lowest value obtained. The lowest value obtained was 1.25. So we divide 1.25 by 1.25 and 1.875 also by 1.25. This gives us a ratio of 1 is to 1.5 for iron and oxygen. Now, in order to conclude the empirical formula, we need these values in whole numbers, the simplest ratios in whole numbers. So in order to convert this in whole, into whole numbers, if we multiply both these values by 2, so 2 into 1 makes it 2, and 2 into 1.5 makes it 3. So we end up with the ratio of iron and oxygen 2 is to 3, making the empirical formula Fe2O3. So in conclusion, the correct option for question 10 is option B because option B has Fe2O3 as the correct empirical formula.